Welcome everyone to day three of our 2022 30 by 30 conference. My name is Jeanette Southwood. My pronouns are she, her, L. I am black and I am an immigrant. I am an engineer and I am vice president, corporate affairs and strategic partnerships in Engineers Canada. Prior to joining Engineers Canada, I led the Canadian urban development and infrastructure sector and global sustainable cities teams at an international consulting engineering firm, where I was the first black woman to be appointed to the senior leadership position of principal globally. At Engineers Canada, my team's portfolios include public policy, public affairs and government relations, outreach and engagement, communications, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Today, as we meet on a virtual platform, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. And I would like to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the effect of residential schools and colonialism on Indigenous families and communities, and to consider how we are and can each, in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'd like to start off our session with some technical tips for the day. Today's speakers and panelists will be speaking in English. However, there is simultaneous interpretation available in French. The instructions for how to access the interpretation are currently shown on the screen. Closed captioning in English is also available today and can be accessed using the closed captioning button in your Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you mute the microphone in order to avoid any interruptions during the presentations. And should you encounter any technical problems during today's sessions, technical support is available in the chat and you can message Rachel Sir directly and her last name is spelled C-Y-R in the participant list for support. In addition, Engineers Canada's Cassandra Polizu, our Manager, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and Yasmin Tanachan-Blacklock, our Associate, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, will be monitoring the chat throughout the day. You can use the chat to connect with other attendees directly, or once again, if you are experiencing any technical issues. We would also like to remind you of the resources provided to you for the conference prior to today, including the conference expectations, we ask everyone to approach this session with empathy, understanding, respect, and kindness for both your community and for yourselves. So with that, I'll now invite Kim Buffard, Engineers Canada's Manager, Outreach and Engagement, to introduce the first segment of the day. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Jeanette. Hello, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Kim Buffard, and I'm the Manager of Outreach and Engagement for Engineers Canada. As many of you know, Engineers Canada is committed to ensuring that we have a diverse, equitable, inclusive profession. And in my role and within my portfolio, I support Engineers Canada's EDI efforts by working closely with strategic partners across Canada, applying a lens of intersectionality to our K-12 career awareness programs, and through the management of strategic partnerships and joint collaborations with members of the broader engineering community, such as our regulators, higher education institutions, and with NGOs and private companies looking for opportunities through our national outreach programs, campaigns, and our community practice to share best practices and move forward common goals. It's for this reason that I'm very excited to participate in today's session. At the end of 2021, we put out a call for nominations across the nation for individuals and workplaces who are doing excellent and meaningful EDI work in the engineering field. These folks were nominated by their own employees and colleagues and have truly led the field to a more equitable future. Today, five of these nominees join us to discuss their work, the challenges they have faced, and the sex successes that they have had. Please welcome Claudia Gomez Villeneuve, who will be the moderator for today's discussion. Claudia is a professional engineer, university professor, EDI champion, and brand new fellow of Engineers Canada. Claudia previously worked at Enbridge managing petroleum pipeline projects for over 15 years. Today, she works at five different universities, 
that's right, I said five different universities teaching engineering and project management in both English and Spanish. She is also the founder and two-time chair of Women in Engineering Summit, a nonprofit organization whose mission it is to support the 30 by 30 initiatives by Engineers Canada by sharing practical solutions to keeping women happy in engineering and geoscience for life. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kim. It's, uh, it's actually my honor to be your panel moderator today on our last day of the 30 by 30 uh, conference. I, it's bittersweet to reach the end of the, the conference, but it's also important that we finish our program. So hello to everyone and welcome. Congratulations to all the newly minted 30 by 30 leaders in our panel today. I was so happy to learn of the 30 by 30 initiative by Engineers Canada years ago as a member of APEGA, the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta. My main job is actually to teach project management to engineers in university. And I teach them that having a numerical target in projects is how you reach success. So achieving 30% by 2030 is not only an inspirational goal, it's also a research-based goal. My dream is to walk into my classroom January 5, 2031, and have so many women in the room, in the classroom, that I cannot count them because there's so many, uh, and I have to start the class. I, I've already seen the future. I studied engineering in Colombia, South America, and when I walked into my classroom, we were 50-50. Back then, when we judged gender by only two, two different categories, um, but it was 50-50. So I've already seen the future. So hopefully Canada will reach it as well. Let's get started with the panel. Our panelists today are Nicole Wilson, Shore Roshani, Josh Workman, representative Stantec, and Marine Neves. Nicole Wilson is a postdoctoral fellow with the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Alberta, applying human behavior research for enhancing the effectiveness of equity, diversity, and inclusivity practices and initiatives. She has supported the development of a gender equity allyship group, faculty hiring equity practices and outcomes tracking, and climate surveys for students, as well as setting outcomes for K-12 outreach programs and equity practices. So welcome, Nicole. Next, we have Shore Roshani. She's a professional engineer and proud owner of Ursa Environment Inc. She's dedicated to helping other women, especially those who face additional obstacles, find success. One way she's doing this is through her work with Westem program. She developed a six week program for Westem, W E S T E M, Westem, designed to support women entrepreneurs with immigrant and indigenous women in mind and titled it Breaking Down Barriers. She's dedicated to helping other women, especially those who face additional obstacles uh, for whatever reason and help them achieve success. So welcome, Shore. Next, we have Josh Workman. He's a principal transportation engineer and the Calgary office leader at Stantec. His professional practice focuses on retrofitting urban transportation systems to better accommodate people who walk, wheel, and take public transit. He has worked with communities across Canada to plan and implement bicycling, walking, and transit infrastructures in support of equitable mobility. Josh takes pride in having co-founded one of Stantec's first LGBTIQ2 plus employee resource groups, ERGs in 2018. Today, Josh is representing Stantec, which was nominated as an employer EDI leader. Welcome, Josh. Last but not least, we have Marine Neves. She has more than 20 years of engineering experience in the design and execution of complex projects in both Venezuela and Canada, covering oil and gas, pipeline distribution, manufacturing, and most recently in the field of hydrometallurgy in her current role at Sherrick International. Last year, Miriam launched a not-for-profit organization, 
Mujeres Omega Inc., which provides or profiles a role model for Latina women and focuses on providing opportunities for women to experience personal growth, networking, and thoughtful conversations. So welcome, Mighty. Each of these individuals have a slight different path and a slightly different story, but have been champions of EDI in their respective workplaces. We have three amazing questions for our panelists today. So my dear panelists, I will ask you to respond one question at a time, and I will rotate the order of speakers when we change questions. So are we ready? We are? Perfect. All right, let's start with Shore. Shore, the first question is, tell us about your experiences in advocating for EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion in engineering. Go ahead, Shore. Thank you, Claudia. My main experience was facing the obstacles through my education and every stage of finding jobs. But other than that, through WSTEM, as you said, I had the opportunity to prepare a program that was run last year, as well as being a business advisor for them, for other women who are starting businesses. Other than that, uh, my business, since it's a small business and it's flexible, and I have a team of some retired and some engineers who are helping uh, to my business, they are volunteering actually. So for example, I have a portion of my clients who are handicapped, or sometimes they live in very remote areas in Alberta. They have no access even to email. They just call me for the services they need. And I have a team that they can come and help me. For example, I do environmental assessment, but I've done three years of structural work. And if I see there's a concern, I will just tell them that I will bring another professional with me to assess the situation. And if there is a problem, we can address it for people who don't have access to big city facilities or they are on a wheelchair uh, or for other reasons, they don't have accessibility to these professional services. Back to you, Claudia, thank you. Thank you very much, Shuri. Next is Mariam. Mariam, the same question. Tell us about your experiences in advocating for EDI in engineering. Hi, Claudia. Um, well, yeah, as to say, my name is Maidin, and, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a mom and, and a daughter and a wife and a friend. But uh, I'm Canadian, but I also have a uh, Venezuelan um, Portuguese roof. So thinking back on what it, uh, the day I decided to be uh, an engineer, I remember myself like sitting with my dad that is also an engineer. Um, when I was filling out my applications for universities, he, he asked me, he said, actually, like the only university we can afford was the one on the neighboring city. So yeah, I wanted to go to the capital, like I wanted to go abroad to study, but that was the only one. So I was 15 years old at the time. Um, took a glance of all the careers that were in that particular university. Electrical engineering was not in my considerations. That's the only one I say no to. Me. And then I pick uh, mechanical engineering. So next thing I knew, I was 16 years old, living by myself in another city and going to university to become an engineer. Um, the days in the university went very fast. In five years, I was already graduated. Um, so with 23 years old, I finished up, landed my first job in a consulting company and I recognized the one in, back home. And then the year after I was already married and start having a couple of kids. Moving to Canada was the real challenge because I didn't speak the, the language. So um, when I came in 2009, I remember trying to, to land my first job in, in, in Edmonton, but no one was hiring at the time because the oil prices were down. So I joined Toastmaster, attended every library, joined book clubs, 
and relearn how to do resumes, how to land interviews. Um, I remember I went to a career fair and that was aligned to meet uh, the mechanical uh, manager. And I was in that line and when the guy get my resume, he say, I remember his words, he say, how, how can I hire you if I don't even understand what you're saying? Like, I mean, you, 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 this sounds very good with everything that is right here, because back home I was already an uh, intermediate uh, piping engineer and I was already about to take a position as a mechanical lead for a project. But, but here he offered me a job as a junior engineer and I took it. I was so happy to, to, to start working. Like people can think that this was kind of discrimination or, or, or something like that because you know my background was not recognized. But for me, the, the, I mean, I was very grateful that I finally landed my, my first job as, a, as an engineer. I left that job for four months after because I, another company actually hired me as an intermediate mechanical engineer. Um, so I decided to go and it was a site mechanical engineer position. So I found that probably going to site was a better way to learn. Uh, like if I see a, a bomba in my mind, I know it's a pump, right? Um, if I see a valvula, I know I'm seeing a valve. So the way to, for me to, to learn the language was practically that year going to, as a site engineer, right? Um, then the next challenge came 2015 when I, it, again, the oil prices were down. I was the mechanical lead for the line three project at, at Enbridge. And they asked me to go on vacation, but my son had a concussion the, the two uh, months before and all my vacation time was gone because I have to attend medical um, appointments and rehabilitation and all that. So when they asked me to go on vacation because the project was in hold, I, I didn't have vacation, so I got laid off. And it wasn't until 2016 when I start working back in, in Cherik, it's the company where I work right now. I like the, um, two years ago or pre probably three years ago before the pandemic, Cherik, they started a, a ERG called Leakers. And when I attended the, that, that meeting that they saw that the company was taking uh, considerations to uh, put uh, like to work towards a uh, woman rights that thing clicked in my mind because I, I, I thought if I've been mentoring people here in Apega since many years ago if I've been volunteering every time I get the chance for United Way and so many other things why not to start something for Latin women to put their, like to share the knowledge that I have. So that's, that was the, in that, in that place, like that day when, when I was in that liquor things is when I decided that we have to start, I have to start doing something, but for, for Latin women. And My that's name, how. Can you tell us what Mujeres Omega means? Cause oh, Spanish, yeah. right? <laughs> Mujeres Omega, uh, me, woman means a uh, mujer. So mujeres omega, um, there is so the alpha women. They're so they're so uh, overrated. I see. I, I I think because the alpha woman wants to be the one that is in the you know all the high positions. And I think ah uh, omega is the uh, other the letter of is, the alphabet. Got is it. the other letter. So the oh. omega is actually the one that like me that uh. It's not only career. I, I put my family and I put my, like I, I recognize that I need other people to help in achieving my career. 
And with that, I mean my husband, my family, everything that supports my team. Thank you. So, thank you for explaining that, Madam. I'm going to ask you about challenges next. Yes. So, so thank you for explaining, Omega. Thank you. No worries. Our next is Josh. Josh, tell us about your experiences <laughs> in advocating for ADI in engineering, please. Thanks so much, Claudia. And um, I'll maybe just start by um, sharing that I'm here on behalf of, of Stantec, a uh, global design and engineering firm, you know, with more than 25,000 employees globally. And I feel really humbled to be here alongside such incredible advocates for uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the engineering community. And it's also something that I feel really uh, personally connected to and, and grateful that Yasmin and the Engineers Canada team have taken such a thoughtful approach to, to setting this space for us to, to talk about the, the work that we're all doing. Um, and, you know, I, um, in my own experience as a queer person, uh, had, had always sort of felt a sense of uh, not belonging in the uh, engineering career opportunities that I had up until uh, arriving at Stantec. And I was struck when I um, you know, first entered into the, the doors of Stantec, how my queer identity was, was really welcomed and celebrated and supported um, with, with everybody that I connected with and with uh, the senior leaders in particular that I was able to receive mentorship from. And um, <clears throat> over time, uh, in, my, in my tenure at Stantec and the opportunities that I had, I was both able to contribute to advancing um, many of our initiatives in inclusion, equity, and diversity, and also learn more about them. And you know, what I learned and what I want to share with you in terms of how Stantec is really taking a leading role in shaping equity and diversity and inclusion um, in, in the engineering community um, revolves around really a systems-based approach. And so we understand that, you know, it's not just about what happens inside the walls of our organization. It's really important that we, we advocate and we contribute towards a pipeline of of um, new graduates coming into engineering programs uh, globally, where we are positioned to make sure that, uh, you know, as you had alluded to, Claudia, engineers and the engineering community in the future really reflects the diversity of the communities that we're a part of. Um, and so that takes shape in a lot of different forms. We have a $200,000 equity, diversity, and inclusion scholarship program that we run every year focused specifically on BIPOC youth gaining access to post-secondary opportunities in STEM-related fields. Uh, we have partnerships with um, on-the-ground organizations globally related to things such as mentorship uh, for underrepresented and disadvantaged communities uh, to um, find opportunities to learn about careers in science and engineering. And then we extend that to our approach for, for hiring or culture change inside our organization. I was really fortunate, as you had mentioned, to be a part of uh, starting one of our first Pride at Stantec ERGs. And this followed, you know, really strong presence of women at Stantec employee resource groups uh, that facilitate sharing and leadership development and opportunities for women at the grassroots level to share their experiences, to advocate for change. And that's paired with a top-down mandate for change. And right up to the board level of Stantec, we have uh, accountability from our most senior executives as to how they are achieving our equity, diversity, and inclusion goals. So this isn't just something that we say, this is something that we do and that our leaders are held accountable for. Um, and one of the specific programs that I honestly have a lot of admiration for and I wanna share with you is one that two of my colleagues here in Calgary started called Elevate for Women. And this came out of a, um, uh, a program that they participated in supporting uh, leadership growth for women in our organization. And they wanted to share what they had learned. So they took the initiative to design a three month program through the pandemic where women could come together, share their experiences, learn from internal and external leaders and find a space of support uh, in a really intentional and designed way so that they could uh, um, you know, more successfully move towards the career goals that they have. And I think what I'll close with is that 
you know, we're finding a lot of success with this. And so, you know, a few of the um, statistics that I'll highlight from our, um, uh, you know, most senior senior leadership levels is that, you know, 38% of Stantex board members are women, 38% of our C-suite are women, and 25% of our, of our C-suite are women of color. And so this makes me, you know, really proud to work here and to continue being part of growing this change over time with such incredible people all around me. Thanks so much, Claudia. Thank you so much, Josh. And uh, Nicole, tell us about your experiences in advocating for ADI in engineering, please. Thank you, Claudia. And I'm really honored to be here with these amazing co-panelists of mine. Um, so my experiences have been really varied and um, as Claudia mentioned, I come from a background of psychology and business where um, there are more women generally. Uh, and so coming into engineering, uh, one of my first experiences about 10 years ago, presenting my research on um, people's experiences with human resources policies and use of them in engineering, uh, I presented to a board of leaders in Edmonton, business owners of large businesses and um, I was a bit blindsided when uh, the only woman in the room stuck up their hand and challenged me and said my research was maybe not um, accurate of women's experiences in engineering. 50% um, of the participants in my study were women. Uh, so that was one of my earliest experiences. Um, and that was, that was a, a difficult one. But since then, I've seen a lot of uh, had a lot of really exciting things happen and really positive things happen and, and of course, very difficult things uh, as well. Uh, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things I've seen, uh, you know, mostly because I get to work with students and it's so exciting to see them uh, achieve their goals. Um, I think one of the one of the most exciting things that happened recently was that we have a, a group of students who are working on increasing inclusivity in engineering and this was kind of a grassroots thing they saw that students were experiencing more harassment in online classes and so they came up with four tangible actions they presented to the senior leadership team of our institution and um they came up with like testimonies for why that needed to happen and they had all they had pulled together this project on their own of where we needed to go, which was amazing. Um, and since then, I think three of those things have been implemented of the four. And one of those students I've seen um, received an award for citizenship from our faculty and is now off to Oxford in the fall. So they've achieved both goals in making engineering a better place, but also advancing their career. So I'm really proud of, of them. Um, and I think other things I've seen happen is, um, uh, Claudia mentioned there's an allyship group that I advise and, uh, and seeing a bunch of folks who, uh, especially men who, um, I think in society haven't necessarily always felt like they had a place in um, gender equity work and seeing them kind of come together and be able to talk about uh, how they feel about it, where they think they could maybe do better, where they think they need to learn, um, and feeling like they kind of had a, a community of people both uh, within their group and then also kind of building their relationships with folks from uh, gender equity deserving groups. Oh, apologies, if you can hear that. <laughs> it's normal, it's been two years of lockdowns, this is normal. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, I think the last one I'll share is um, having students email me with excitement that their professor invited the whole class to introduce themselves online um, and invited them to share the pronouns they use. Um, and I had more than one student email me about that and it felt like they felt, they felt heard um, and they felt seen. They've been asking for this uh, for a while and we've been trying to share information with it with professors and so those types of opportunities have been just feeling like while they're small, uh, small aspects of, of uh, a day, they, they really encourage and spur things on for us to do more. Indeed. Thank you so much, Nicole. We are about halfway through our time available for the panel. So I'm going to ask you to answer the next two questions a lot faster so that we can complete all three questions. 
The next one is on challenges and obstacles that you have experienced maybe as an individual working in your field or as an institution, if you're managing a department or a company. And I'm gonna ask you about intersectionality. So before I do that, let me define intersectionality. This is one of those new terms that has come due to all these equity and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Intersectionality is defined as who we are as a person. Each one of our identities impacts and intersects with another identity that we have in our current social, economic, and political structures we live in. For example, if you're a woman, you're, you experience womanhood, your experience of womanhood is impacted by the systemic manifestations of your gender, also your age, also your racial identity, your sexuality, your religion, your nationality, and any other identity you hold. For example, I'm a mother of three children. So my experience of womanhood changes because also I am a parent of three, right? This framework of understanding is known as intersectionality, intersection, different identities all coming together. It was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw and refers to the interconnected nature of social organizations or categorizations that can create inseparable overlapping and interdependent systems of privilege or disadvantage. So you are not just you, you are a many different identities in one. And that combination makes you you. So that's what the question is about my dear panelists. So let's start with Josh this time. Josh, here's the question. Tell us about challenges that you have faced and what is the biggest obstacle you have faced as an individual or as an organization if you're managing a group um, or institution? So go ahead, Josh. Thanks, Claudia. So what I'm gonna talk about is uh, a challenge that we faced within Stantec um, related to burnout of the uh, leaders of our employee resource groups. Uh, which number about 56 uh, across our varying um, represented groups and, and different identities, and um, how that overlaps with the work of allies, you know, especially men, uh, you know, white men, cisgendered men, to participate and, and lift up the, the effort of these, these groups within our organization. And so the, the sort of tension here that, that we faced is that, you know, really passionate uh, representative from many equity deserving communities um, really put their hands up to drive forward change, leading our employee resource groups when they first were initiated. But what we found is that there's been varying levels of uh, success in uh, transition planning, succession planning for some of these employee resource groups, um, and the ability to maintain momentum and energy. Um, alongside that, one of the challenges that we've really felt is that there's been a certain level of hesitancy uh, from non-equity deserving groups uh, in terms of how they best participate in a meaningful way, demonstrating allyship without performing forming allyship in a way that supports these individuals in their in their time and their effectiveness in growing inclusion and diversity in our organization. Thank you so much, Josh. Next is Nicole. Same question. Any challenges or obstacles you have faced as an individual or as an organization if you were leading a group? Thanks. Yeah, I um, lots of what Josh said resonated with me in my experience uh, as well. And uh, a couple more things I'll I'll just quickly add. Or um, there's a lot of conversations about women in engineering and men. Um, and so changing the language, changing what we measure um, and what we talk about in terms of in terms of intersectionality and, and acknowledging there are many aspects of our background, our identities and our experiences that um, that we need to consider. <laughs> oh dear. Um, and, uh, and, and many more genders than just women and men. Um, uh, and so I know that when I started uh, in my current role, we were measuring 
what we said was gender as female and male, uh, and now we're measuring it very differently. And I think there's six categories and a comment box and that kind of thing. So um, that's a that's a challenge, I guess, in just having learn learning and changing the how we speak about these things. And uh, I've been trying to do that through reports, but also how I speak uh, and what I say as well, and and some of the resources we put out. Um, I think another challenge is how our brains categorize and match new information. So we, our brains want to like put, create kind of categories or boxes. And so when it comes to intersectionality, those boxes overlap often and there are multiple boxes for a person. And, um, and so getting my brain still going to categorize things, but having um, me think about that and what that means uh, and how I want, like my brain can think whatever it wants. Uh, what I do uh, is something different so I can decide that. So that's something I've also uh, tried to think about as well. And so yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Claudia. Thank you so much, Nicole. I happen to like the sound of babies and children in the background, so don't worry. <laughs> It's like music to my ears. Next is Mairim. Mairim, the same question. Tell us about one challenge or obstacle, the biggest obstacle perhaps that you have faced as an individual or as the leader of Mujeres Omega, leader of an organization. Yeah, um, well, I pursue my uh, engineering career um, the term international may be new. So that's what I used to say, wearing so many hats like a soccer mom, hockey mom, dance mom, cheerleading mom. And that's also with two, that's on only two kids, but so many hats to, to wear, driving kids around town and attending so many uh, tournaments and competitions while at the same time working on me, my career, right? Um, and what, what, I, what I think about uh, an obstacle, it's not an obstacle actually, it's part of, I believe is part of my background and my own bias. Um, my background is, uh, is a lot, I come from a line of a strong woman. My, my grandma raised six, chi six children by herself. So um, when I mentioned this is because I, when I first learned about diversity and inclusion, it was a foreign term to me. I, I wasn't, uh, it, it was difficult to me to reconcile with the fact that women actually need other allies or need someone to advocate from them, especially because I, I come from this line of strong women where I, I, I believe I can do everything by myself. I don't, I don't, I, sometimes I don't even think that I need someone to actually push or help. So finding, um, like having contact with organizations that actually work and define diversity inclusion for myself is, is, a, is being a challenge to understand and put myself in, 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 in the shoes of other people and even to other women and understand when, what they're trying to, to, to do with, when they, like, like the example I made, uh, someone can think that uh, it was a victim of, you know, some, someone wasn't recognizing my, my experience. But for me, I was actually very grateful about it. I wasn't even thinking that that was a, a, a problem, right? And that's because of my own bias. So for me, I recognizing my own bias on, 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 on the term is, is being the, the most challenging. Thank you so much, Martin. And uh, last but not least, Shore, challenges faced and biggest obstacle that you have faced as an individual or in an organization? Well, I would say the challenges that I have faced mainly as a minority religion, as an ethnic minority, as a woman in engineering has been uh, and or like racism and or sexism, like both of them. During my university, for example, if, if a professor tells me engineering is not belly dancing or other racial comments they come up with, I had a place to go to, to complain. Or if I had a professor that in the middle of his speech, he would talk unkindly about 
East Indians, I would know, okay, he has, you know, racial comments. And I remember I wrote my midterm exam after the day after my sister died, because I wouldn't go to talk to that professor. I knew he wouldn't believe me because he thought, you know, anybody immigrant just lies. So I, I went and wrote my exam. I passed that course. I could have done better if I was in better condition and not so sad, but I still did it. But what I find in the work situation, especially small consulting places, that there isn't any hot anonymous hotline or, you know, something like that. Uh, so uh, like when I have experiences like seven hours sitting in a truck with two other guys who like to listen to a vulgar radio station that is not professional, even if there wasn't a presence of woman. I, I have nowhere to go, you know, uh, if uh, a Pakistani supervisor of a supervisor comes and holds the beer cup and says, sure, you should drink, you're too stressed at work, you would work better. And then anytime he talks to me, says you are stressed because you don't drink. I have nowhere to go. You know, there is no right for anybody to pressure other people against their religion and tell them, oh, if you don't drink, you are Muslim, you're lying, you're not Baha'i, you know? I have nowhere to go because human resources works for the same boss that is doing this. And a pega needs a witness for non-professional conduct. So throughout my career, I had really nowhere to go. And I had seen, especially as the IT, women who quit. And they were not visible minority. Like I had a friend, she was Ukrainian and she didn't have any accent, but just witnessing what's happening, she just quit. Uh, she went to art. She said, I'm not doing engineering anymore. Uh, yeah, so I think this is a deficiency of system that minorities cannot speak up. Uh, and um, I, as my, you see in my background, it's three generations of religious persecution that I have been through. Uh, my grandfather was beaten so hard that he didn't survive the beating because he was Baha'i in Iran in a village. My father, my uncle, and my cousin, they were killed by extremist religious government. And my mother was imprisoned. And from age eight to 23, I saw extremist guards and stuff coming to our house going. So, uh, I am very conscious of injustice and ethics. Uh, and it is really hard to see that uh, I can't really do anything when I witness other women suffering in small consulting engineering businesses, or when I suffered, there's nowhere to, to go. Um, but I'm resilient, you know, I'm third generation under persecution migrating to Canada. So, I didn't give up. Anytime anything major even happened, I came back and I started a different way. And when my mother got ill, um, really ill, she was has been ill since 94 that we migrated to Canada. But when she was so severely ill that I had to, I couldn't be employed anymore, any kind of employment, not just engineering. I had the option that I could go learn how to be entrepreneur and have my own small business. And um, I didn't have option, that option of having my mother in a senior home comfortable. It was close to me again because of racism. Uh, my mother was getting hit by other seniors and police didn't care and management didn't care. We couldn't take care of the problem. So we had to, we made our uh, master bedroom, a senior home location, like similar to senior home that she can live comfortably. So as an immigrant, um, as a woman of Middle East, as a religious minority, it's so many things that intersect as a caregiver to an 89 year old mother. There's so many things that intersect together. And as an engineer being in environmental field, I actually get a lot of verbal attack with biologists to white males. They can tolerate a, an engineer white or engineer color man to be in the group or a white woman. But when they see me, whether it's interview or a work setting, they would do anything. They would do their best to make me quit and I never quit. 
uh, and I had nowhere to go to complain for anything. I never had anywhere to go because the system is not set up. It's not like government jobs that they have anonymous hotlines I can go to. And I'm sure many other women just like me are suffering for the same problem. Thank you, Claudia, back to you. Thank you, Shore, for sharing that. That is actually how bad it can get, right? When we don't protect equity, diversity, and inclusion, people go into physical abuse or murder. So thank you for sharing what happened to your family in Iran. Um, that's, that's a perfect explanation of an obstacle or a challenge. We are almost at the end of our panel, and I'm going to ask you all to give me your last thoughts. So Josh, Marim, Shore, Nicole, one last chance to share your final thoughts with us. And I'm going to start with Myrim. Sorry. Yeah, the, the, the last question was to kind of describe the, the leadership you're trying to embody, right? Um, well, we're, so, we're out of time. We're out of yeah, time, Yeah, I know, so I know, we, yeah. We are, I know we're out of time. So that's why I, I want to close with, um, concept about a, it's a Venezuelan writer. She wrote the book, Hello Fears, and she's called Michelle Poller. And she talks about every everyday leadership and how to become influencer for good. Not every influencer needs to be an instant celebrity. Here, all of you are influencers because all of you are influencing people in their behaviors. So I believe uh, on, on the power of that, of everyday leadership, and you can become an influencer in your own home, in your own community, on your own work, and share, and share your knowledge with other people to share your ideas, your thoughts, yeah. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you all, all of you, Nicole, Josh, and Sharem for sharing with us today. Thank you, Madam. Next, I have on my list, Nicole. Any final thoughts to share with us? Sure, maybe uh, one sentence. Um, one thing that I'm trying to practice every day is humility and to uh, acknowledge that when I see it in others and to be grateful when um, people share their experiences and to use that as being um, uh, an inspiration to create change and to change, make changes, uh, like Shore said, to the systems, um, to the organizations, uh, to policies, practices, uh, because that's the level at which um, makes a real impact for people. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Shore, any final thoughts to share with us? I'd just like to thank Engineers Canada and every one of you. It was great to learn more, to know that there are people who care and they are thinking about change. This was great. There is hope. There is a new horizon. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Shore. I agree with you. <laughs> and Josh, any final thoughts to share with us uh, and from Stantic as well? For sure, thank you, Claudia. I'll, um, uh, two final thoughts. I wanna start with a um, gratitude for all the, the panelists and you know, Shore, especially to you for having the courage to share your story with such vulnerability and courage that, that has, was so moving for me. So, so deep, deep gratitude to you. Um, and the invitation I want to offer to, to those who are here, especially, you know, folks who might be carrying in their backpack of privilege, you know, having an identity as a man or maybe a identity of, of being a non-racialized person is to bring both listening and courage. Know when it's time to step back and listen to the other people in the room and know when you need to bring your privilege forward to create the change that is so needed in our industry. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, thank you, Josh. So we have reached the end of this great panel. Thank you, Josh Workman. Thank you, Nicole Wilson. Thank you, Shore Roshani. And thank you, Mayrim Neves. Your stories and your efforts to expand this 30 by 30 initiative 
are really moving that needle forward and making the lives of women and other groups in engineering and geoscience more enjoyable and more fulfilling in the long term. As Kim said in my introduction, I'm the founder of WES, Women in Engineering Summit, and this year's online summit is on Friday, June 17. So maybe I will see you all again. Back to you, Kelly. Excellent. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes. Great. First off, I just want to thank you to the, the panelists, a big thank you to the panelists, and to you, Claudia, for being such a fantastic moderator. Uh, we are so grateful to hear from you all as EDI leaders in the engineering field, not only for your insights today, but your work in EDI every day. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Reed, and I am Engineers Canada's 30 by 30 board champion. Engineers Canada's board created the strategic priority around women in engineering in 2019 and has been supporting the 30 by 30 initiative at a strategic level. Last week, I attended the EU CI Leadership Conference for Women in Energy, and Manitoba Hydro called out Engineers Canada's 30 by 30 initiative, stating it was helping them to obtain momentum and that they were not alone. This is one example that the work you are all performing to support this is being recognized at other forums. This is something we can all be proud to be part of. From the EUCI Elite Conference, I have a few key takeaways I would like to share with you today. One, research shows women feel they need to be 100% qualified before taking on a new role, unlike men. This is an unrealistic expectation that causes females to miss out on opportunities. We need to encourage ourselves and others to get out of our comfort zones. Two, Manitoba Hydro also mentioned that girls in high school are not taking math and physics needed for trades. This is a similar situation to engineering. They've created a pre-placement program for women to assist with this. They too use high schools and even elementary schools to have trades women talk to young girls to encourage them, similar to what we do. But this is still an issue. And three, they use an inclusive term of aspirational goals versus targets. Targets can give the impression these need to be met, even if individuals are not fully qualified, whereas aspirational goals imply we will strive to achieve them, but not reduce our standards. In 2020, we achieved nationally 20.6% of newly licensed engineers who are women. This is for the first time ever. We're moving the bar. We're making a difference. And I thank you all for your efforts. We'll be taking a short break before our next segment, please feel free to replenish your water, make a snack, and stretch your legs before we return at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. Everybody's trickling back. Um, you've had a chance to refresh your drinks or grab a quick bite to eat or um, do what you needed to do. Um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Cassandra Polizu. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the manager for equity, diversity, and inclusion at Engineers Canada. In the spirit of decolonizing my own language and my own sense of self, um, I recognize that I'm a visitor on the traditional and unceded lands of the Amama Wininawag and Anishinaabeg peoples. As we wrap up this third day and the last session of the 30 by 30 conference this year, we wanted to take a pause, um, take a moment to focus on, on the EDI champions that are here amongst us. Um, the panel discussion that we just had actually talked a lot about burnout of EDI champions, talking about how the burden often is on underrepresented groups, marginalized individuals, folks who experience either trauma or discrimination to try to make space for themselves and for others who are marginalized. The work of disrupting systemic oppression and supporting inclusion is incredibly emotionally taxing. It is exhausting. And we do need to take time to fill up our cups. And we've been doing this work with 30 by 30 champions for several years now. And we recognize the passion, the insights, um, the drive uh, that individuals bring to this work. And it is all about those individuals here today. Um, so this session is really focused on a bit of self-care, a bit of taking pause. And so we've, uh, we've reached out and partnered with Campfire Kinship and we're really excited about that. Um, I first met Gary in 2019, it was. Um, I had a chance to talk with her on the topic of women's stories. I recall her passion for women's success, 
um, wanting to support women to grow their confidence in addressing unconscious bias in the workplace, especially given her experience as an engineer herself. In 2020, she launched Campfire Kinship, um, which is aimed at supporting women in STEM and consulting for organizations and companies on equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies. And uh, we posted the, the link to Campfire Kinship in the, the chat there if you want to check out more of what Garazi is doing. Um, she uses a unique story-based approach that empowers groups and individuals to become more inclusive and impact-driven. And so we're really excited to pass the mic over to Gary Three for the next little bit um, to wrap us up for our last session for the 30 by 30 conference. Welcome, Gary Three. Amazing. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Cassandra. And hello. we're actually going to try and practice some self-care skills in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So this session will be interactive, which means you'll have a chance to explore the theme in small breakout rooms. So we encourage you to stay for the whole session if you can, so that you can benefit from that live practice. If you need to leave, that's totally okay. Just let our host know ahead of time. The reason being, uh, because we're assigning breakout rooms, we don't want to leave someone by themselves in the room if we can. So if you have to leave, um, just let us know, but we trust that you're doing what you can to, be here, to do your best to be here. So. Uh, with that said, I'd like to start this session by reminding myself of my purpose. I'm sharing my screen here, and I hope that um, you all can see it. I have a few different monitors going, so just making sure. And if you can't, just let me know. Um, so I would like to begin this session by reminding myself uh, of my purpose and centering this discussion on the importance of self-care. And more broadly, self-care, I think, is related to healing and restorative practices, which are critical in the EDI work, right? I, I truly believe in the power of stories to heal and to restore and remind us that we're all connected, right? And there are three parts to this that you can see on the slide. Um, so where I focus my work on, on that first part called discover is really around being connected with mindfulness. So I help teams go on their own personal exploration journey on their values and their purpose and basically asking them, you know, how did you get to doing the work that you do today? Because often when we're called to do our work and stay committed to it, there is a personal connection, right? And it's not just the personal connection. It's those moments when things get really, really hard, right? How are you remembering about what you've been through that reminds you of why you're doing this? Right? So this takes the form of mindfulness exercises, this takes the form of meditation and generally journaling, and today I'm actually going to lead us through that aspect, so uh, stay tuned for that part. Um, the second part in the middle you see here called the center is the community aspect of storytelling. Right, uh, Healing, I don't think it's just an individual practice, it's a fundamentally a community and relational practice. And let's be honest, right? these spaces don't just get created on their own. Right, especially in a workplace setting where there is a high degree of change and where people are busy, right? A lot of people might feel like, well, why would I share my experience, right? It feels too vulnerable. And I would argue that every experience is worth sharing because the condition of human life is that you're not alone. And I, I just felt that even from being part of the EDI panel, listening to these stories, listening to your lived experiences, makes me feel like, okay, I'm not alone in the experiences that I've faced. And together, when we start to take action, we can do these things. We can make change happen. So I intentionally work with leaders to create these spaces where we can gather, reflect, and share our experiences. And then we can start to understand what, what is it can, that we can apply from what we learned to advocate, not only for ourselves, but also for others. And this doesn't need to take up a lot of time. So and today you're going to see this happen in actually around 15 to 18 minutes, right? But we have to be intentional about it. And I'm going to lead you through a storytelling practice that I'm certified in, which uh, I will explain in a little bit more detail shortly. And then this last piece that you see here called Deepen is uh, about sharing stories more broadly. Um, we won't get, we won't have enough time to get into depth on this part specifically, um, but just for context, uh, I do want to share an example with you as to how I'm doing this work in the community right now. So in this picture you see here, it's, it's hard to tell, it's a small picture, but uh, I'm working on a, a book on the stories of immigrant women, thanks to a grant that I received from Calgary Arts Development. Um, and there are almost 40 participants from over 30 countries 
who have gone through these workshops and written their stories on their immigration experiences. And I'm proud of this cohort because not only have they shared their experiences so candidly, but to see them find solidarity in that experience, even in that diversity of 40 countries, right? That has been quite transformative for me to witness because it just reinforces that when you get to hear a story that normalizes a stigma or you get to see representation, that shifts our conception on what's possible, right? And that's one way to break the cycle of biases. So storytelling helps us celebrate a part of ourselves and a part of our narrative that we haven't yet reclaimed and, and unites us in that way. So that's why I'm passionate about storytelling, uh, in case you're wondering how an engineer turned into a storyteller. Um, but in this workshop, I'll give you a little bit more of a glimpse on how we can use storytelling for self-care. So I'll get us started. And um, as I said, this will be interactive. So I would like to open up our first breakout room if uh, Rachel from Encore can support us with that. And just before we head into the breakout rooms, uh, I'd like to just um, have you introduce yourself, right? And there's some questions here that I'll paste on the chat as well. Basically your name, on, name and pronouns, where you're calling in from, what brought you here and what you hope to get out of this session. So if you can please share that in your introductions, in your breakout rooms in just about a minute, um, that'll give you a chance to meet others in the conference and then we will welcome you back in about four minutes. Thank you for joining us back. I hope you found that uh, experience insightful. I hope you got to meet someone new as well as um, share some strategies around burnout. I know our time was a little tight, so I had to, we had to bring everybody back. Um, oftentimes, I was just saying earlier to Cassandra, oftentimes when we run these workshops, um, people would love to have a little bit more time to share experiences. And so um, I know time was a little bit tight, but I still hope that you found that experience valuable. Uh, I would just like to close by thanking you all for your participation today. And thank you so much to Engineers Canada as well for this opportunity to share what I love and um, create the space for sharing our stories on such an important topic like self-care. If there's one last message I'd like to leave with all of you, I'd say is self-care is not self-indulgent. I, I hope that you really take that time to prioritize yourself as well as the people that you work with and that you serve and that you care for. So once again, thank you so much. If anybody has any questions or any follow-up that you would like, uh, I just left my contact details here on the slide and I can type that into the chat as well. So thank you. Okay, I think it's over to me now, folks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gayathri. Uh, that was an excellent session and, and uh, uh, sometimes introspection really helps in, in creating a way forward for us. So uh, uh, thank you very much for that, that session. Um, my name is Gerard McDonald and my pronouns are he, him, ill. Uh, and I'm the CEO of Engineers Canada. And unfortunately, I have the, the sad task of bringing to a close of a busy month of our 30 by 30 conference. Over the past three sessions, we heard from champions who are working hard every day to increase workplace equity, uh, to unpack the true theoretical benefits of intersectional frameworks who serve as champions in their workplaces and who help us practice self-care. The topics we heard today do not begin and end with this conference but our practices we must embody daily. Engineers Canada is committed to maintaining this kind of knowledge sharing and building momentum to reach our collective goals of 30 by 30 and broader inclusion in engineering. We're excited to continue this conversation next year in Halifax for the 2023 30 by 30 conference. More details will be shared in our 30 by 30 newsletter in the coming months. Finally, Engineers Canada is excited to have developed an EDI course for engineers and geoscientists with the guidance from the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Training Task Force, made up of representatives from the 30 by 30 Champions Network, the National Society of Black Engineers, Canadian Chapters, National Sciences and Engineering Research Council, NSERC, Chairs for Women in Engineering, Engiqueers Canada, and in partnership with Engineers and Geoscientists uh, BC and Geoscientists Canada. The Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for Engineers and Geoscientists online course is available on EGBC's new Knowledge Centre. 
This self-paced one-hour online course is free uh, to all engineers and geoscientists across Canada. And we hope you're going to have a chance to take a look at the course as part of your continuing education credits. So let me close by thanking our staff, most notably Cassandra Palazu and uh, Yasmin uh, Tonachan uh, Blacklock, who have contributed to this event and the EDI work we're doing. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you found this, uh, ses these sessions as exciting as we did. Take care, and we look forward to seeing you all next year in Halifax. Bye for now.